outside. They're going to ring the um, the bells, get them, get uh, everybody moving uh, into the rooms. Um, the first, we have two keynotes today. Um, the first um, is is a mentor of mine who I've known for a long time, uh, Dr. Robert S. D. Higgins. He serves as the president of the Brigham and Women's Hospital and executive VP of the Mass General Brigham. He uh, roles which he assumed in December of 2021. He's a distinguished academic and clinical physician with a long track record of collaborat collaborative leadership. And he's joined the Brigham from Johns Hopkins where he was the Halstead Professor of Surgery. He's received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth and his medical degree from Yale and his master's degree in health uh, service administration from Virginia Common Health. Uh, he completed his general surgery residency from the University of Pittsburgh and his fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Yale and senior registrar in transplantation in the UK. He's been the president of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the president of the American College of Surgeons Society of Surgical Chairs, and the president of UNOS. He's authored more than 200 articles and book chapters. He's a proven innovator with the ability to manage complex multidisciplinary services at world-class organizations, and he has a passionate advocate for research. It's my um, uh, distinct honor and pleasure to have Dr. Higgins deliver this portion of the keynote address. Bob. Thanks, Vino. I'm really uh, honored to be here. Uh, it's an interesting perspective. I think um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit out of my league as a macro surgeon. Uh, who's now a, a suit in an administrative role at a, uh, a big uh, academic medical center. Um, maybe not what you want to hear from uh, when you're thinking about innovation in cardiovascular medicine. However, I think my perspective has been honed over the past 35 years as a heart and lung transplant surgeon who did also valve and coronary work in a number of different places. And I was very fortunate to be mentored and have extraordinary colleagues who help support the career. So I hope from 10,000 feet to talk a little bit about what's happening in healthcare, as it is the focal point of why I think innovation has to continue to thrive, uh, and particularly in cardiovascular medicine. And if we don't uh, evolve as we did in the past, we're likely to uh, be challenged significantly. Um, so I'm hopeful that it will provide some insights. I'm also going to, you know, do a walk down memory lane in a number of these areas um, and talk a little bit about things where innovation did make a difference. And as you heard, uh, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first kind of mitral intervention. We'll talk a little bit about some of that. And so we're really very fortunate to share some reflections with you and hopefully it'll stimulate some thoughts and some questions. So <clears throat> we've been certainly involved in some very dynamic challenges over the past three years. And uh, I'm fond of this concept because it really has been a perfect storm. And you might imagine, it might, it might uh, resonate with you that it's been a particularly bad or critical state of affairs that uh, influenced many of the extraordinary things that we want to do but have often not been able to do in the last several years. It really has been a perfect storm since March and I'm fond of this book <clears throat> um, coming from New England that characterizes the experience of commercial sailors who went out into the North Atlantic Sea and were challenged by three extraordinary forces that ultimately took their lives and prevented them from pr uh, pursuing their livelihood. And ultimately, this relates, to the, uh, relates, of course, to the pandemic, but also the economic challenges that it is provoking even now after the acute phase has been uh, dealt with. It's had significant economic impact. And as a secondary aspect of this, some of the socio-political things that have evolved, which all of you are well aware of, created a, a very difficult set of circumstances. And I think ultimately has challenged healthcare to figure out what its future is. So these are just some of the challenges that I face on a regular basis and many of you are part of these kinds of administrative roles, but also in your practice or in your community. They really create an extraordinary set of challenges for us as leaders. Whether it's creating a culture of safety or managing our increasing costs, improving healthcare has always been the center and the focus of what we're trying to do on a daily basis. 
But we really have to make sure that our workforce, and including the people in this audience, the surgeons, the nurses, the practitioners, the perfusionists, the PAs, the nurse practitioners, all feel like they are a priority in this context. We need to really be able to attract the best and the brightest folks to help support innovation and technology as it relates to cardiovascular medicine. And then the ever-changing ever healthcare landscape in terms of finances, uh, it really is an extraordinary time uh, because there really is not enough funding in the healthcare system to allow us to do all the extraordinary things that we hope to do. So there is a financial crisis in healthcare. If you didn't understand that, it's pretty clear. Again, this is from 10,000 feet, and I hope I don't bore you, but uh, this crisis has really created extraordinary uh, pressure in terms of cost of providing care as well as the revenue associated with it. So we were facing some of the worst inflation in decades, and there is a significant impact on our workforce in terms of power outages and shortages of those who really are critical to provide the care. And we see that, of course, the health expenditures in the United States continue to escalate. Uh, as a result of some of these pressures by, by comparing us to other international environments where healthcare is better controlled. These staff shortages are choking the U.S. system, um, and staff shortages, without belaboring the point, um, really are important, not only for practitioners, but also for the workforce that takes care of our patients and does the healing. So it really is a challenge. It has been declared by some as a national emergency. Um, I didn't realize that this was such a significant issue. And as I've been in the administrative leadership role now for a year and a half here in Boston, recognizing that there's a shortage of close to a million or more nurses leaving the workforce each year. That is remarkable if you think about where is the work going to get done? Who's going to take care of our patients after we do that mitral valve repair or that fantastic transplant? That's where the healing is going to happen, and so we really are challenged. We're also challenged by the lack of healthcare professionals like lab workers and paramedics and other people who are in short supply as well. So it's really a challenge. Now, again, <clears throat> the budget pressures, the gathering storm that we've talked about from a federal financing standpoint, it really has put pressure on us, whether it be the deficits, uh, and thank God we uh, uh, funded the uh, healthcare system for another uh, year or two, but the fault really is with all of us, both physicians, practitioners, government, insurers. There is blame to be spread around to everyone. Uh, we all have a responsibility from an American healthcare system. I don't know uh, so much with the European systems, but certainly opportunities for us to continue to improve. And I think um, industry and uh, biotech is also recognizing these are challenges that we have to address. Following record activity in 2020 to 2021, the biotech market has slowly uh, kind of tried to figure out where it's going to go. And ultimately, these initial public offerings signal that industry is also concerned about what's happening in healthcare. And they've been reticent to kind of provide support. But I've been a, a guy who thinks about the world as the cup is half full, it's not half, half empty. And I hope to provide you with some optimism for um, our future as we think about moving forward. And I love this quote from Winston Churchill, that if we were pessimists, we'd see the difficulty in every opportunity. But I'm hopeful, as optimists, that we'll see opportunities in every difficulty and model behaviors that will ultimately give us the resources and the power to work through these challenges. So, I think there is a silver lining behind every cloud. So as we said, the economic pressures are significant in terms of inflation and COVID and the impact it had upon us. But in fact, as leaders, we have an opportunity, and I would say an accountable leader has a responsibility to respond to these challenges. And through innovation, we can provide extraordinary resources. And this is work from McKinsey that uh, has been consulting with us in terms of how do we manage a 80,000 person health system with a $16 billion revenue stream and extraordinary uh, hospital responsibilities. And so they're providing us with opportunities to do things to promote revenue, but also control our expenditures. And that includes delivering uh, care that's being transformative. 
And so you learn a lot about the Brigham and Mass General, and you hear about all these um, extraordinary health care pressures. We're working side by side to try to address many of them. And ultimately, if we can improve the care that we provide by shifting some of the care to less expensive environments, we will uh, gain, gain revenue and control expenses. Likewise, we're limiting our administration, um, enhancing clinical productivity, and many of you are under that pressure to do more with less, but in fact, that may be a solution that helps keep you whole financially, but also allows us to continue to maintain our clinical productivity. But I think technology and enablement will ultimately be the solution. And so that's where I think the innovation will uh, lead us to a better future. Now, if we take the, the example of the uh, vaccine innovation, as many of you know, <clears throat> The uh, Boston ecosystem was very important in that process. Uh, these vaccines were uh, developed through medical research and clinical trials. Uh, the Moderna vaccine, uh, the Brigham was the number one enroller in that trial. <clears throat> and our colleagues at the Mass General were also critical in developing this technology, which ultimately, within eight months, potentially saved millions of lives through medical innovation. And ultimately, this is the picture of the, one of the nurses in New York who was attributed with receiving some of the first life-saving vaccines in their uh, community. And so the vaccine was formulated in January and ultimately led, in many people's opinions, to saving uh, millions of lives. So, but if you examine the business case for innovation, this is representative of what the future could hold for innovations as you are exploring in your conference this week. So medical innovation not only reduces the duration of pandemics, like the one we just went through, but it also creates a platform for growth and development. So medicines and equipment have to be manufactured, distributed on a massive scale, and ultimately personnel need to be trained to administer these treatments. So innovation in, in settings like this pays dividends in terms of training and economics. And if you look between 1970 and 98, medical discoveries added more than a trillion dollars to the national wealth. One trillion dollars over the course of uh, close to 20 years. And so these discoveries not only reduce mortality, as you do every day in open heart surgery and in uh, thoracic uh, operations, but they also improve the quality of people's lives and benefit all age groups. And so this is the case, of course, for innovation as a uh, thought process moving forward. In our own system, it paid extraordinary dividends. This looks at the research revenues that we generated during the COVID pandemic. There were 263 new COVID awards totaling $132 million and an extraordinary sense of productivity among our community, our scientific and innovation and discovery community. And so it was the engine that drove us through the pandemic. And now with under $800 million under our uh, research portfolio, it was really extraordinary. Indirects that came to the hospital for reinvestment in clinical innovation, in clinical care, and in workforce uh, development. So it paid dividends in spite of the crisis, and we're fortunate to have benefited from that. Likewise, if you look nationally, um, the life sciences still was a very healthy place, a portfolio for people to invest, even though it didn't match the same uh, rate at 2021. But over the course of the last 10 years, investments were really at a historically high level. 30 billion invested in biopharma in 2022. And ultimately, these companies really invested, as many of our uh, folks who are demonstrating their work here, it's really a remarkable space. And so innovation can still pay dividends going forward. So now, as I did some research for this talk, I tried to think, well, how do you assess technologic change in cardiothoracic surgery? And I'm going to show you some obvious examples that are near and dear to my heart uh, and many of you. Mostly it's in the space of research and development 
where these kind of innovations kind of evolve, and then they allow for clinical trials and potential clinical evaluation, and then ultimately widespread clinical practice. And this is an article from uh, the group at the Columbia assessing technologic change in cardiothoracic surgery. It was published in this uh, uh, the seminars of thoracic cardiovascular surgery in 2009. So how does this kind of translate? If in that study they looked at the most expensive conditions billed to Medicare and patients who needed care in cardiovascular space. And as you see, the number one uh, uh, disease was coronary, coronary artery disease, followed by uh, congestive heart failure. Uh, number four was acute myocardial infarction, pneumonia, complications of devices, respiratory failure, cardiac dysrhythmias. So the cardiovascular space is really important in terms of a focus of innovation and development. And if you fast forward and look at what, what's happening in terms of who's in the hospital sick and needs cardiovascular care, well, heart failure is number two on the list. Uh, diabetes and complications, that includes coronary artery disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and so on down the list, cardiac dysrhythmias. So our field, the pathophysiology that we see every day, is ripe for our continued focus and innovation as we develop our programs. Now, I'm going to walk down a memory lane here a little bit and talk a little bit about innovations, of course. My point, I think, in, in, in emphasizing this is as you look around the room here, there are many leaders in cardiothoracic and cardiovascular medicine. And the role of leadership, from my perspective, has been not so much um, to demonstrate that we are great because of our power, but because of our capabilities to empower others by sharing our wisdom with our colleagues, by sharing our wisdom with our trainees, by, again, increasing the platforms of innovation, it can make a huge difference. And I think that's why this, uh, this symposium is so important, because you're sharing your wealth of insight and knowledge with those who are uh, uh, really interested in learning more. Well, this is in the tradition of surgery, as uh, I was fortunate to serve at uh, Johns Hopkins as the Halstead professor. And it really was, from the 1800s, his principle. And I think it's important that we need to make sure that we mentor the next generation so that they can then benefit from our knowledge and our wisdom. Uh, again, scientific evidence for clinical decision-making was critical. And I think that still rings true today, that surgical training and clinical care are strongly influenced by evidence-based research. So this is a connection, certainly in an academic setting, of research, discovery, and education. I'm hopeful to make some points in that regard. And I'll show you some examples. Again, I reference the idea that this year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the treatment of mitral stenosis. And this is a picture from a report that Larry Cohn uh, authored in uh, the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 93. And it chronicled the, uh, the uh, experience of Elliot Cutler in 1923, if you can imagine. And in conjunction, in conjunction with his uh, cardiology colleagues, they performed what we believe is the first transventricular mitral commiserotomy using a tenotomy knife on a 12-year-old girl who was dying from rheumatic heart disease. And I think probably uh, Tor Sunt maybe referenced this case um, uh, in, in one of the other talks. Um, probably do a more thorough job than I would. But here's a case report that shows that innovation was saving lives and ultimately was a huge opportunity. And I'll show you some other uh, examples. Again, if you think about cardiopulmonary bypass and its evolution, um, again, this is a quote from Lily High, and it really speaks to the seminal work that they did at the University of Minnesota in the early 50s and into the 60s, uh, 60s where they participated in some of the first open heart procedures at the University of Minnesota. Now, I always was fascinated by these kinds of uh, thought processes. If you look at the history of cardiovascular innovation, it's remarkable. This was a picture of a baby being subjected to hypothermia for cross-circulation open heart surgery in the 50s. Can you imagine? Then they went ahead and used the mom or the dad as the reservoir for perfusion. And Lillehei had this idea that these cross circulation could actually help support the cardiovascular space and uh, prevent anoxic injury 
in the child while they fixed the baby's heart. And so here's a picture. Just imagine the innovation and the guts to do this. So lo and behold, there's the mom or the parent on the right side of the screen. Not getting much attention, it doesn't look like. And in this picture, uh, there's people like Norman Shumway as a trainee who learned how to participate. And Vincent Gott, who was the first chief of cardiac surgery at Hopkins. And they were students in Lily High's lab working on this cross uh, uh, perfusion experience. And they had significant uh, results that were really impressive. And there's a, a, a publication from Gott in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery chronicling their experience in these very, very sick congenital heart cases. So that's pretty remarkable. If you think about the success in the 50s and 60s, that's remarkable how they innovated to save lives and ultimately improve the quality of life for these young children. So innovation, again, continues in so many ways. Again, I'm partial to the transplant story. Many of you know this story well. This is the first report of Shumway and Lauer in their dog work in Stanford in the early, uh, late 60s. And they successfully transplanted a heart from one dog to the other uh, using deep hypothermic arrest. But there's more to that story, and I, I thank my colleague, uh, Bill Baumgartner, for sharing many of these slides, and, and you, some of you may have seen this. But over the course of a decade, the developments in experimental laboratories were foundational in providing the kind of critical care that was necessary to succeed in the transplant space. These are just some of the examples, hypothermic arrest, um, again, denervation science, learning about the EKG as a predictor of rejection, developing transmyocardial biopsies uh, or uh, endomyocardial biopsies, uh, the use of rabbit antithymocyte globulin, and then the first applications of cyclosporin for heart and lung transplantation, all in the course of 10 years of experimentation in the dog lab and in the primate lab. Now, the other fantastic thing about this as an academic uh, uh, thought process, this was funded by NIH-funded research. They had a program project grant that provided all of the resources, nearly $20 million, and numerous investigators who were led by Ed Stinson as the PI. It was really remarkable that they built the research and then used that as a foundation for clinical growth and development. And now we, we understand that transplantation is among one of the most extraordinary modern uh, miracles. Most patients surviving, uh, certainly the first year, w with greater than 80% survival, no matter what the complexity of their disease or their illness. And so the survival after this pr preliminary work was really extraordinary. The same could be said for uh, the evolution of the robotic assisted cardiac surgery. There are many of you more familiar with this data than I am and these successes. But it just talks about how the progressive leadership necessary to explore and innovate, whether it be in Leipzig or Paris or Munich, and uh, in my experience, the first exposure I had was in Columbus, but all across the world. And this really advanced the science of robotic surgery in so many ways. Again, thinking about the endo cabbage system and, and ultimately figuring out how to do the procedures, it was remarkable. This was the uh, example of the first ITA harvest at the, in the U.S. at uh, Ohio State. Um, again, uh, Wolf, uh, Dr. Mitchler and Wolf all kind of worked to, diligently to try to make this come to reality. And the same kinds of ex uh, ex extraordinary things happened in lung transplant. Again, Jim Hardy gets uh, credit for being the first person to transplant in 1963, um, but many other people contributed long before that experience. Whether you think about uh, Alexis Carell or Demikoff or Metros uh, in uh, Belgium and around the world, and these people really were pioneers in terms of uh, transplanting. The Toronto group, of course, performing the first single and double lung transplants and perfecting some of the problems with the bronchial anastomoses in the dog lab primarily, and then moving to the primates, and then, of course, the Stanford group continued its work in uh, heart and lung transplant for uh, peripheral vascular and uh, pulmonary vascular disease. I just want to spend a minute talking a little bit about the Stanford experience because it really was remarkable. 
they perfected the surgical technique, uh, addressed the tracheal healing, and autotransplant to demonstrate survival, and then used cyclosporin to demonstrate extended survival. They did that in a primate model and ultimately really advanced the cause while still working collaboratively with international groups to determine the benefit of immunosuppression with cyclosporin. And in 1981, it was quickly approved, and ultimately that was the door to open for uh, successful survival, not only at Stanford, but around the world. But again, this work was a collaborative across the international setting. And now you think about what's happening in lung transplantation. High-risk donors are moving across the country using uh, uh, systems that really maintain the technique uh, of transplantation and then can be transplanted 24, 36 hours later after resuscitation. And this is, again, work that has been advanced by uh, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, uh, Kachavsky in Toronto. Pardon me. And now the, the latest innovation, extraordinary thinking about to try to fill the void for congestive heart failure, which has expanding needs, refractory to medical therapies, and where LVADs are not available, we need to expand the donor pool. It's estimated that close to 10 to 20,000 people die waiting for hearts and lungs. And this was a early in January 2020, 22, one of the first innovations for cl clinical human translation of transgenic and uh, uh, xenotransplant um, uh, experiences. They had to nav navigate infectious barriers, physiologic barriers, resources, and other ethical issues. And they really engineered the technology to be able to innovate a pig transplant to a human. Now, it didn't get long-term success, and they're working through the kinks and the challenges there, but it's ultimately extraordinary in terms of going forward. And of course, uh, near and dear to all of you, the TMR and TMR uh, and TAVR experience really has grown and developed uh, over the past several years and ultimately will be the future as we move forward. So this minimally invasive wave is really a manner in which we can improve patient care but also re receive better outcomes and shorter length of stay. And I think this will ultimately be the future as we go forward. More and more patients will receive TAVR as opposed to SAVR or surgical interventions. And there'll be protective strategies, as you know better than I, to protect from embolic uh, complications related to these procedures using uh, sophisticated embolic filters and other devices. Again, we're likely to see that uh, the, the TAVR explosion will continue and it will grow. This is some data early on from the uh, trajectory, and you see how many patients now are getting TAVRs as opposed to this uh, traditional uh, transsternotomy approach. Our board has recognized that we need to kind of advance the training of these young people as well by creating structural heart disease fellowships and creating new tracks in cardiac surgery focusing on training and the acquisition of these skills to make a difference. Ultimately, these young people will still be looking for jobs but we need to make sure that we can train the next generation in terms of being uh, prepared for innovative strategies that go forward. Our training paradigms and our, our boards have to be able to support that. So now the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are the barriers to innovation and basic science success for most surgeons. And many of you, may, this may, message may resonate with you. Most surgeons, when surveyed or asked, cite these challenges, that there's pressure to be clinically productive, there are administrative responsibilities which are excessive. There's also difficulty in obtaining extramural funding. And they ultimately want to have some balance in their work life. Again, many, many people are struggling with the idea of how to advance this science in non-academic settings, but still uh, benefit patients and benefit the, from the training and learning the lessons they need to be successful. So these challenges are obvious, that we have this pressure to perform clinical activities. Ultimately, we have to create an, an underwrite infrastructure to support research. And again, from my perspective, having impact in that space as a cardiothoracic surgeon, we invest close to $150 million in training for surgeons, physicians, cardiologists in our space to make sure that we stay on, on point with innovation and technology. 
And again, surgeons are often challenged to kind of split their clinical research and teaching and administrative roles. Ultimately, the young folks require an investment in their, their development so that we can help them be the next generation of innovators. So I believe that we have to identify, I think, scientists with the greatest potential to succeed and invest in their future. I think we have to build partnerships with basic and translational scientists to integrate surgical research programs, likely with our cardiology colleagues, and invest in those folks with philanthropy to support startups and investments and partner with industry to do so, and focus on the development for surgical scientists because they are the future, and they are the people who will ultimately help us find the next discovery. Mentorship and sponsorship is critically important in that space. So, our charge then, as I have been fortunate to now lead at the Brigham and partner with my colleagues at the Mass General and across the system and our 82,000 employees, is to identify and invest in exceptionally talented and well-trained young surgeons and provide role modeling and build practice environments to facilitate their research and their discovery. And ultimately, we have to be able to compete across the platform with industry and others as we have seen in other places like Baltimore and Cleveland and Minnesota, investments in this infrastructure creates platforms for innovation for the future. So as I close, I want to say it's pretty clear that there's a storm ahead, potentially behind us, and we have to really deal with these economic challenges. Whether it be labor shortages, inflation, affordability, it threatens original investigation and investment in innovation. So we have a responsibility. I believe we can and must survive with innovation as our foundation by investing in the next generation and creating research innovation opportunities for young and old alike. I think some of these things will be nested in patient care delivery transformations, improvements in clinical productivity, enablement of technology, and greater opportunities for investment. As as, as well, there's likely to be a necessary investment in telehealth, artificial intelligence and informatics, robotic technologies, as I'm sure you'll showcase in this conference, and structural interventions, as well as end-stage heart failure and lung disease. These will create the next generation of revenue streams to enhance healthcare. And uh, we have some, obviously, some challenges to cross if we think about xenotransplantation, whether it be ethical or legal challenges, and regulatory obstacles, as well as getting our training paradigms to match up with the needs of the future. But I'm hopeful that we will continue to make progress, and I appreciate the opportunity to share some reflections from 10,000 feet, and I hope that uh, you have a great conference, and thanks so much, Vino, for the invitation. Great. Thank you. Bob, we have a couple of minutes uh, for questions if you have time to sure. do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and please come to the microphone if you have any questions uh, for um, uh, Dr. Higgins. Maybe I'll start off with a question. You know, right now, I want to understand um, maybe where your thoughts are at, at your level and an executive. I'll give you a, a, a true example um, where there's a new transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement through a femoral vein procedure that we do. And we've done 40 of them a lot. We're losing 10000 per patient from a hospital a reimbursement point of view. So we do the procedure, they go home, and my CFO comes to my office about a month ago and says, I just want you to know you've done most, almost most in the world, and every case you do, we lose $10,000 on. So technically, we're losing, we just lost $400,000 on your procedure. And now it may become clinically available. How am I going to deal? How am I going to continue to let you do 40 or 50 of these a year and knowing that you're going to lose half a million dollars every time we do this every year? How do we deal with that from an innovation point of view, a potential benefit to a patient's point of view, and merge that with an administrative point of view? Do we allow hospitals to do that? Do we work on that? Do we need to go to CMS and say, you're really underpaying us for this innovation? Is there a pathway in your mind to do this? Because obviously every procedure can't lose half a million dollars or, you know, over a year. Then you, you wouldn't be able to do anything. 
How do we do that? Is there something on the government level? Does a hospital do it? Should we work with the industry? How does that work? Just in your, if, if, our, if you're well, in that scenario, what do you do? Well, I, I, I like your CFO, and if he's looking for a job, <laughs> he can come work for me because he's asking the right question. I think if you look about at the, what happened with Taver, I guess, there was a, a, a concerted effort. I think Joe uh, Bavaria is in the audience. He probably understands the negotiation we went with the federal government about getting an appropriate reimbursement for those procedures, knowing that they're new technology. In the developmental phase, uh, I do think that uh, institutions have to invest, as I pointed to. So we have an innovation fund, and I think my colleagues at MGH have similar, where they invest in programs that have potential. Um, and it may be a, a cost neutral, it may not be, but that's a, a way for us to create a primary focus and a, a presence in the marketplace to be a leader in that space. Um, I think it's a challenge. Uh, I think the technology probably has to become less expensive. And uh, again, if they want to get traction in the market, uh, I guess I would defer to others. Um, I don't know what happened to the price of TAVR uh, over the course of the past several years. Has it gone up or gone down? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the numbers. Okay, so based upon the market pressures, if they want to get enough bandwidth to expand, it has to be, I think, price sensitive. So industry has a conundrum, and I'll tell you why. Um, and I know some pretty, pretty reasonable numbers. In the state of Georgia, if you have a TAVR procedure, your reimbursement is somewhere around forty-five to fifty-five thousand. In Cal, but the price of the valve is thirty-two thousand. In California, the reimbursement for that same procedure is a hundred thousand dollars. Same price of 32.5. So in California, if you give me a TAVR. I just made $100,000 in Georgia and in Oklahoma. You're negative 10 to 15,000. You know, five, five to 10,000 per patient. So we're stuck a little bit, where innovation is continuing in some pockets of the country, but not in others. Yeah. At, at Cedars, they want more TAVRs. In Georgia, they want less TAVRs. Yeah. So that's the problem. And so I can't, you have to have a, have to have speak a very to strong it. government and, and regulatory group that's working with you in the state to negotiate better pricing. Yeah, but the price um, hasn't gone down, FYI. Yeah, so I think yeah. that's the challenge. And I think that, uh, again, uh, states like California have been pretty proactive, I guess, and uh, they've been able to negotiate to better rates that then fully gives them cost recovery. The reality is, if you look at cardiovascular procedural volume and revenue, I think it's the number one revenue generating kind of book of business in most hospitals. Yep, yep. that's right. And so some of those resources that are generated for cabbages, valves, uh, other procedures might have to be shared among the programs um, that would benefit across the, across the whole uh, spectrum. Yep. That's one approach, I think. Uh, we think about that. But cardiovascular is the number one reimbursed uh, set of procedures. And it's a huge uh, market advantage for us to be very busy and very strong in all of those spaces. Yeah, you had that in Maryland in some ways when you were there. Right. Um, yeah, questions in the back microphone. Just identify yourself. It's Gulam Abbas from West Virginia. And I had the privilege to be uh, the resident. Uh, Dr. Hagan was my um, program director when I was a fellow at Rush. So uh, you've always been an inspiration for us. There are two quick questions. Uh, one is um, actually a comment and a question that when you plant an apple seed, you will get an apple tree. You don't expect an orange tree. The medicine uh, celebrate the heroes who do more, more fancy procedures. So do you think it's a role for a pair like Medicaid to come and see uh, disease-specific teams have to decide about the treatment? Like if a patient with lung nodule knocks the inter interventional pulmonologist's door, gets a biopsy, radiation oncologist will treat it with SBRT, surgeon will treat it with robotic segmentectomy, same patients. So is, is there a role or a valve, like a cardiologist will go for the transcatheter versus a cardiac surgery, is there a role for Medicare or payer to mandate, see a disease-specific team has to review the case and, and writing, say this is the best treatment for the patient? and to control the cost of health care? Well, that's a great question, Abbas, and good to see you. I think uh, Joe Bavaria could comment, you know, uh, again, when the original discussions were about TAVR reimbursement, they had to have a surgeon and a cardiologist uh, evaluate the patient preoperatively and then uh, participate in the procedure in order to get fully reimbursed. I think that's a great rule. I think it's a team sport. So it's, a, it's intended upon us to try to build that relationship with our cardiology colleagues and, 
and those who are you know, partners in this process. Again, I'm not in the middle of the space in terms of negotiating these things, but that would be uh, a, a tactic that we would employ and continue. It's been successful for us in the TAVR space. I assume it applies for any structural heart disease um, uh, activities, but maybe, uh, you know, is that true? Or Joe, is that true? Joe, you're, you can comment on this as you're coming up. The, that I think we need to have more um, instances where CMS is de dealing with this problem. Yeah, I mean, the, the radical and revolutionary um, aspect of TAVR was uh, not only at the level of the technology and the innovation, but also at the level of, of two other areas, which was um, at the professional society level, where you, for the first time you had multiple pro professional societies working together, coming up with really, rad uh, really kind of revolutionary concepts and literally uh, writing the law um, that was then passed by uh, uh, the Congress in the Federal Register through CMS. So it was a pretty amazing, amazing thing. Right. It was the first time uh, that, it, that the federal government uh, tried to control the, um, you know, the rational dispersion of a new technology, uh, not only from a safety standpoint, but from a, a cost standpoint as well, uh, by not encouraging, but mandating uh, the heart team uh, and uh, uh, so I think the U.S. was kind of in a lead in, in that respect. We'll s the problem is CMS by law can only do this for so long, and then they have to kind of sunset the NCD. Um, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, we just had a big meeting, uh, Vino chaired, uh, uh, last week in, uh, in Washington, D.C., so we'll see what, see what happens regarding this. Great. We hope for the best is that this innovation in technology kind of expands that similar heart team uh, approaches would be favored. The last question, Dr. Subramanian. Hi, Bob. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? Uh, continuing on the economic conundrum, which uh, we note pointed out, interstate, uh, since now I've become an executive director of the Pitt you know, Brigham and Ma Mass and Brigham, we had an issue the same way in New York State. Uh, when we used to do minimum invasive coronary bypass surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, we got paid 45000 whereas if you get a conventional coronary bypass at Columbia Presbyterian Cornell, which is predominantly conventional, they got $95,000. So this is by insurance, not by Medicare, insurance. So, and, um, so we got to settle the <laughs> interstate variation. We talk about variation practice, variation reimbursement, not by Medicare, by insurance company. So in fact, one of the insurance companies, Oxford, we were a part of the plan, initially set up a, a whole year price. That means you do a coronary bypass at a PTC, you'll get a set price and you take care of all the costs down the year with an EKG with visits and everything else. What are you trying to do in Massachusetts, you know, or at least in Boston, by inter-hospital variation and reimbursement with the same procedure, not even innovation, same procedure? Well, they don't really want us to uh, compare notes, but within a system, we have, a, a, I think, a relative perspective about um, managing the reimbursement across our system um, for a given procedure, whether you have a procedure at Mass General or the Brigham. And assuming that that's going to be roughly the same uh, within the system, uh, I, I do think there's some antitrust considerations. They don't want to price fixing across the state. Um, I, they think that's probably not ideal. And we've got a very kind of progressive thought process in that regard. But I, I think you're right. I think the, the interstate, inter regional variation does create a challenge. I think these are uncomfortable conversations and unfamiliar conversations for most of us, yet I think it, it behooves us to be aware of these issues going forward and professional societies like this can offer an opinion about uh, reimbursement as well as coverage and the, the heart team. And if we can be at the table in those conversations, we have a better chance of securing the appropriate funding the appropriate reimbursement for the amount of work that we're doing, and particularly as innovation evolves. So you may actually have a business orientation for new innovations and making sure it's valued appropriately by those regulatory bodies in the state or nationally, Medicare, that would be setting uh, reimbursement in that regard. So a uh, call to action, maybe. Right. Well, Bob, thank you very much. All right, great. Thanks. We have a second speaker that I thought um, kind of ties into what my lecture was um, about yesterday. Uh, it's Dr. Michael Mattis. Uh, he has had three careers. 
He's had a dedicated and very successful juvenile delinquency career. He'll talk to you about that. And he joined the Navy, um, so maybe he wouldn't end up in, in a place where a lot of juvenile delinquents go. He switched careers, thank God. He, and he ended up uh, graduating uh, from the uh, University of Minnesota Medical School. And then he went to general surgery also at the University of Minnesota and received his thoracic training at the University of Toronto in 1990 to 1992 and consequently came back uh, to Minnesota in 1992 as a faculty member um, in 1992. And a decade later, he retired. And before he retired, he had risen to uh, the full professor and the head of the Division of, of Thoracic Surgery at the University of Minnesota and became the director of the General Surgery Residency Program. His third career has also been a field of personal resilience, and he's encapsulated this experience really in a concept called the Resilience Bank Account. I purposely didn't discuss that yesterday because I knew he was going to talk more about it today. And it's really about physical and mental well-being. This has now been published in the January 2020 of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much, Vino. Let's make sure this works. Here we are. Well, it's, a, it's an honor to be here, uh, genuinely, and it's a particular honor to follow in Bob Higgins' footsteps on the podium here. Uh, and it was great to see those photos of the University of Minnesota with the uh, cross circulation since I trained there. And I trained in the old hospital where all those things took place. And, you know, I have a lot of historical memories with John Nigerian and every, everything that transpired there. So I appreciate you sharing that, those slides with us. Uh, the clicker. Well, it's July 2011. And I'm sitting with my son, Sam, on the lawn of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis on induction day. And it's hideously humid, as you can probably surmise from the photograph. But it's not just the humidity that has me sweating. It's my nervousness about my son, Sam. He looks like a baby there. He's 17 years old. And he's about to enter a very difficult four-year period of his life. Well, we're sitting there on the lawn, and suddenly the speakers blare, and we're told to assemble in front of Bancroft Hall, which is the dorm that houses all 4,000 of the up upcoming naval officers. So we, of course, dutifully gathered in front, and there were rows of chairs, and the plebes, as the, in, as the, the uh, first years are called, are sitting in rows in front, and the families and everybody's in back. And after we listened to a speech by some admiral uh, that I have no recollection of, which I hope isn't the case here today, Sam and the 1,100 other plebes stood up, and they formed two lines and they approached these big metal doors and very ceremoniously these doors slowly opened and the plebes are standing there and then they start to walk through the doors in two lines and when they finish walking in these doors close with a thud and of course this is all staged you know for the families and everything else and the point is we've got your children now they're ours and the whole point of the Naval Academy is to turn all 1100 of those young plebes into a uniform bunch of uniform naval officers, right? Well, it's my contention that medical school, and especially residency, does the same thing. For five to seven years, we are all in with training, with little, if any, room for our individuality. And of course, to a large extent, this is critically necessary, isn't it? Because just like the Navy, we have to train competent cardiothoracic surgeons. But the question is, at what cost to each of us personally? Because like Sam, my son Sam, when you walk through that door of residency, it's my belief that very few young adults really know themselves, what makes them tick, what they're about. And if they do know something, there's a real risk of losing that as you go through the process of training in cardiothoracic surgery and in your future career. <coughs> now, in a sense, the Naval Academy and surgical residency are like human factories, right? I mean, fac factories, if you will, started in 1845 with E.R. Squibb, who was a Navy physician and who was the forerunner to Bristol Myers Squibb. And he discerned in the Navy that the medicines that they had, the few that they had, were very unpure and unsafe. So when he left the Navy, he decided to dedicate himself to creating pure and safe medicines. And he started with ether. 
And this was a spark that generated the industrial age. And Ford, Henry Ford, of course, perfected that. And this kind of standardization spread to all aspects of our lives, including education. Well, this spread of standardization gave rise to what Todd Rose of the Harvard Lab for the Science of the Individual calls the Standardization Covenant. Now, a covenant is a formal, binding, solemn agreement. And the Standardization Covenant tells us, know your destination, work really hard, and success will be yours. Now, of course, what does it mean, success? Typically, in this circumstance, it means wealth and status. Now it works. The standardization covenant is the way. It became the way. And if you didn't buy into the standardization covenant, you feel foolish and like you're making a big mistake. Now none of us want to be foolish or impractical, right? Heaven forbid. So we climb the institutional ladder until... But there's a potential problem with this. <laughs> we can end up subordinating ourselves our souls, if you wish, to this process, bit by bit, year by year, over time. It happened to me, and it can happen to anyone through no fault of their own. Now, I, like all of you, climbed this ladder. It was a little bit harder for me, as alluded to by Vino. I was an only child, very poor. My mother was an alcoholic, suicidal woman. I had a violent stepfather. And to avoid, and I ended up on the streets in a lot of trouble, arrested 24 times in and out of reform school. So to avoid prison, which is where I was heading, I joined, that's the picture of me when I was a juvenile delinquent, I joined the Navy and dropped out of high school. And this idea was that, you know, oh, I'll go into the Navy and I'll, have a, I'll be trained for a career and I'll have a job, a job for the rest of my life, right? Well, one night I'm sitting on the back of the aircraft carrier, we're out at sea, and it's during the Vietnam War, drugs were everywhere, I was smoking a joint on the ship, and I'm, I'm thinking about my life, you know, and so I have options. I can go to prison, I could continue to do the kind of work I was doing in the Navy, chipping paint and cleaning latrines, or I can go to school. So I made a decision, I'm going to go to school. When I got out, I got my GED, went to college eventually, very long road, obviously, and then got into the University of Minnesota Medical School, trained in thoracic surgery in Toronto, and came back to the University of Minnesota in 1992 as a young assistant professor. And of course, I arrived on the shores of my new academic job, raring to go to take on the academic triumvirate of patient care, education, and research, which in a way, this triumvirate is a sort of a stub standardization covenant of a bigger one, isn't it? Well, the patient care thing was easy for me to figure out, but the research was more challenging. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had spent three years in the lab killing rats <laughs> and learning how to write scientific papers and grants, but I had no idea what I wanted to do, so I started working on micrometastatic disease and lymph nodes in non-small cell lung cancer. But during my early years there, there were side projects that I found way more compelling and interesting to me. My first one was the rotations as a course idea. Now, I was program director of general surgery eventually, and when the 80-hour work week arrived, which many of you, I'm sure, remember, everybody's bitching a blue streak. You will never be able to train residents, you know, on and on. Change is happening. But to me, the writing was on the wall. We, had to, we, had, we needed to get more efficient and effective with how we train residents. So I took a simple thing. I made each rotation into a course, and we just basically assigned topics, and we made it very clear what their curriculum was, and we met weekly with them, and we went over with cases, and we had a pre, pre and post test and an oral and written exam at the end, and it worked beautifully. I solved a problem with a system. My next one was patient experience. This is something that's always been critically important to me. I'm just crazy about great service in any walk of life but especially when patients are sick and the chips are down. And I've been there and I've experienced terrible service and great service, and it really makes a difference. Well, the patient experience at my hospital at the time was not good. And one of the things that my family and I were very fortunate to do, and it was a value of ours, was to take trips around the world and expose our children to other cultures. And so we were fortunate enough to be in Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, and I was struck, we were at the Four Seasons Hotel, and I was so struck one day that it changed my whole perception around this. I was walking down the path towards the pool, and there was a right angle path that was coming, intersecting with my path. There was an employee on that path, and we were going to intersect at exactly that moment, the same time. 
and, but the employees stopped way back. Now, you may be thinking, big deal. Well, to me, it was like stunning that they all knew how to do that. And they, it happened everywhere at the Four Seasons. They had a system for this. And so afterwards, I beat down the doors of the Four Seasons corporate office, and I got them to tell me their secrets. And it's, they have a book of 350 standards that they followed. That, one of the standards was a path. Second was, what about me? Am I a business traveler? Am I a, uh, you know, a family? on a vacation, whatever. And then the third, wow me if you can. And so I created a system for this and I got our own standards, all this stuff, and implemented it on my service. I created a boutique service and it worked like charm. I mean, patients left our service thinking they were, we were the greatest people on earth. Now the final third project that I had was my resident leadership program. Minnesota residents at the time were there for seven or eight years, two or three of those years in research, and it seemed to be such a tragedy to have young adults in the midst of us at our disposal and we're not teaching them anything but surgical care of patients and how to operate. We, I felt we needed to teach them leadership skills, interpersonal skills, all these sorts of things. And so I had an endowed chair and I used my funds to create this mini program, Myers-Briggs, 360 evaluations, public speaking and the like, and the residents loved it. And I, I learned that I love seeing people grow and reach their potential. So again, I created a system for it. Now when I look at these three side projects of mine, and I think about how much they kind of invigorated me and how much I liked them. The Rotations was a course one. It was nice, but it was kind of mechanical for me. Boutique Four Seasons Service, I got a real thrill out of seeing patients and their families really have a great experience with us. But the one I love the most is the individual personal growth and the resident leadership program. And I loved working with the residents a great deal. Now, if you take this kind of at a meta level and you look below the hood and see kind of what the root issues are or the re root themes are, I love creating systems, I love solving complex problems, and I love, in particular, seeing people's potential and helping them realize it. Now, I've got a bunch of dirty little secrets here, all right? There's a lot of stuff in my academic career that I hated doing, and this is just me. I had a great academic career. I have fond memories of Minnesota and everything that I've done, but this is my experience in my academic career. I hated reviewing papers. I hate statistics. I don't know about R1s, R0s, or whatever all that stuff is. I don't care about it. I hated hurting human beings, trying to convince them of the merits of the future that I saw. It was very difficult for me. I didn't want to be a journal editor, but when I was asked to be journal editor of JTCBS and seminars, of course I said yes. It's such an honor because it was, but yet it isn't something I really wanted to do. And committee meetings, boy, that felt good in the beginning. I'm kind of important. They, they're valuing my opinion, but after a while that just became a time and energy sink most of the time. And research, you know, I did research. If I hadn't had residents doing it, I never would have really done it. I mean, it was great. I liked writing the papers and thinking about ideas, but the fundamental research that I was involved in, I just didn't care that much about. And the stuff I got sick of doing was operating. And I actually hate to even admit that, but once I had perfected an operation, the conduct of it, and I could just go in and almost do it blindfolded, I'd start thinking, you know, how many hundreds of these am I going to do the rest of my life? You know, it started to feel kind of toxically boring to me. And that gets at the important thing, that just because you're great at something, and I, I say this without hubris, I was good in the OR. I wasn't one of these surgeons that couldn't hack it. I was really good. Doesn't mean you love doing it, all right? So that's important. And over time, what happened to me, the things I loved doing just got squeezed by all this other stuff out. And so this is most of my life at the time. And again, this is just me, not anybody here. And I'd suggest you kind of take an inventory of your own personal existence in your work life and see where these things fall. Now, despite all of the stuff that I've just said, the standardization covenant worked beautifully for me. I had one of the greatest honors of my life back then was to go to Brigham and Women's Hospital at the invitation of David Sugarbaker and give you know, the grand rounds that Gerald and Lane uh, Schuster, you know, lecture in thoracic surgery. It was one of the highlights of my whole academic career. And so I was definitely successful according to the standardization covenant. I had money, I had status, I was a professor, I had an endowed chair, my own division, blah, 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 but at what cost, right? Because uh, little did I know, like that donkey here, I was going to go over the cliff chasing that carrot of success because I was sick of all of it. My job, 
running 100 miles an hour constantly for the last 30 years, essentially. And I, I started to hate my job and my career. And I found myself at night staring at this oak tree in our backyard through the big plate glass window, feeling lonely and lost and miserable. And my wife is sleeping, you know, a foot and a half away from me. We had become transactional. She might as well have been sleeping, in, you know, at a, in, on the roof in terms of our connection. And so it was awful. But I would feel so much guilt when I had these feelings because I'm thinking, you know, you're just being weak. You know, you're not, you're not ponying up here. And especially where I came from, you know, to have all this stuff and yet not be happy or content or satisfied, it just felt like criminal activity to me. And I thought there was something wrong with me. So, of course, I pull out my surgeon's habits, which are crucial habits for all of us to have. And that is discipline to keep going even when you don't want to. And, of course, be strong, you know, pretend you're okay even when you're not. And self-sufficiency, you know, you don't need the help of others when you're struggling emotionally or with other problems. And finally, you know, the surgeon's habit, fix everything. There's a solution for everything. And I'll never forget when my wife looked at me one day after I was making a suggestion about something she might fix, and she said, you know, I'm not your damn project, all right? Well, the problem was I didn't have fulfillment. It's a major part of what brought me down, so to speak, because real success is satisfaction or happiness as a result of fully developing one's potential. That's fulfillment. And a lack of fulfillment in our lives can lead to three bad things, alone or in combination. First one is a Groundhog's Day-like existence. <laughs> we can all identify with this, right? Next day. <laughs> Keeps playing though. Just getting through one day after another, and there seems to be no escape. Second possible outcome is like me in bed, you know, existential angst, isolation, depression. And the third one, we can numb out with food, affairs, TV, Netflix, alcohol, to name a few. Any way to escape and get rid of the feelings of rote days, existential angst, isolation, depression, all that. Well, all three happened to me. <laughs> and the reason I'm sweating so much, one of the other reasons I'm sweating so much is because I'm addicted to prescription narcotics. Well, so how exactly do you find fulfillment anyway? And here's the key point, by finding and cultivating your weird, W-Y-R-D. Now, this idea of weird comes from the book Love Plus Work by Marcus Buckingham. And he's very famous for strength finders and other th things like that. He's all about engagement at work and maximizing people's potential. He's written 10 books, very famous man. And in this book, he t brings up the word weird, which is a Norse term, which refers to our soul, our personal fate, your personal brain system, your operating system, whatever you want to call it, whatever works for you. We all are different, and our weird is a thing that taps into this. And the idea is that Deep inside that dark, silent vault of a skull that we all have, just picture that, you know, it's dark and quiet in there, but there's a hundred billion nerve cells firing away. The same number of stars as in the Milky, Galaxy, Milky Way galaxy. And those hundred billion cells are connected to each other by a hundred trillion connections. I mean, these are staggering numbers. And if you imagine that number of connections, the potential number of different wiring configurations is infinite. All right? So what that tells us is that every one of you sitting in this audience has got a unique brain wiring configuration. And it means no one else in the world has your configuration. And what you remember, forget, what makes you laugh, what makes you cry, what delights you, all these things is a result of that. And it's unique to you, and it's a unique prof profile, and it's a pattern that you share with precisely no one else. And so the idea of being weird is great. I mean, we're all different and we need to embrace that. It's a very cool thing. So how does one discover their weird? Well, there are three techniques. Big Five Personality Test, Red Thread Questionnaire, which is in the book Love Plus Work, and then Finding Your Micromotives, which are the most granular and specific, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Now, the idea behind micromotives came from Todd Rose, who's the head of the Harvard Lab for the Science of the Individual. 
And I can't recommend this book, Dark Horse, enough uh, in terms of getting a better understanding of this. And so he's the one that came up with this. And he defined micromotives as enduring, unconscious, unconscious, psychic entities, we're not getting too off the chart here, wired into your brain that consistently exert their presence in any environment, okay? And I like to think of it as our compass, our own personal compass, our true north, our authentic self. And by authentic, we're talking about authentic choosing of choices, making decisions that maximize your weird or your micromotives. That's real authenticity because you're tapping into your own unique wiring system. So the, how do you get at your uh, micromotives? Well, in the book, he talks about the game of judgment, which is quite interesting. It's a way to excavate your micromotives. The very first step is to become aware of when you are judging something, especially vividly, very positive or very negative, okay? And then the second is to ident identify the feelings that emerge, especially the very vivid ones, again, positive or negative. And it's really, it gets kind of down to the things that drive you crazy, you know, the little things that drive you crazy. And the key here is to keep an open mind. It's not about the person or the situation, it's about your reaction to it. And it gives you an enormous clues about your subtle preferences, your frank desires, your private longings. It really gives you a sense of what you're about, that wiring is all about. And so as an example, let's take a look at some of my micromotives. Now, one of my micromotives is to create systems and organize, as you've kind of seen. This is my stove at home. When anybody cooks at home, they don't give a damn where the grease goes, okay? It splatters all over the place, and I care, so I put down towels, and yes, there have been a few fires, <laughs> but we managed to get them put out. I know everybody's thinking he's crazy putting these towels down. Everybody bitches at me at home about it, but I persist. But the real money comes at the dishwasher, all right? Now, I don't know if you can identify what's going on here. What's wrong with this picture? I'll tell you what's wrong. The damn cup is in the bowl lane, and the bowl is in the cup lane. All right? This is a problem. Now, you, you're all probably thinking, this is not a big deal. Just let this go, man. You know, come on. But if this was all, maybe I could learn to be okay with it, but it gets worse. The damn silverware tray. My daughter, Maya, over there on the side, this is how she loads the silverware tray. All right? And we got this nice silverware tray that you can put everything according to its shape and size and everything. Little spoons, big spoons, all in a row. All right? And I've tried everything with Maya and the rest of the family to try and get uh, adherence to these principles. And it's always failed. And I've tried sweet talking, cajoling, begging, sweet demeanor, hey honey, would you mind please putting it in there like that? But never. And I've tried ignoring it, which is not possible, by the way. And so I've only come to the conclusion that there must be, they must hate me, or there's gotta be some deep trauma in the past that has just caused them to resist me like this. I don't understand it. She's over there if you wanna ask her about it. Well. Why does this matter so much to me? I'll tell you why, because when I pull that tray out, it's almost like zen for me, you know? You, you pull it out like this, everything's orderly. I feel calm, relaxed, peaceful. And in one swoop, I can get those silverware pieces out and stick them in the drawer, all right? Efficiency. Now, it doesn't mean that I would like to, like, create a company and organize people's sock drawers for a living, all right, and create a system for that. But it does mean that I have a natural tendency for organization and creating systems around things. For instance, I, all my papers and stuff on all these topics that I'm talking about today and academic papers, I have those files so perfectly with tags and everything else, I can find anything in an instant. And it's something that I'm known for in the family. I can dredge up any document anywhere, anytime. I love doing that stuff. I lose track of time when I'm doing that things. And it actually causes me physical pain when I walk into a surgeon's office and there's papers everywhere. I mean, it's almost I can't even be in there. Now, my second micromotive is to solve problems and figure out the best way to do things, which I think is true of a lot of us surgeons. My wife, Lee, is also weird, but she has a very opposite weird for me. She's extraordinarily creative, she's an artist, and she loves to garden and create beauty everywhere she goes. Well, one day as a husband, I thought, I'll go out and participate, right? And so she wants to build a fence around our, our yard out there, and she's got sticks, and she's very 
natural and just trying things and being creative. I'm always very structured. And, I, and she wants to tie these sticks together. And of course, she's got some leather ropes, and she just ties them together. They're loose. They're not going to last long. So I find myself not out helping her. I'm indoors watching YouTube videos and looking up documents as to how to lash posts together, as if I was creating a horse corral on the movie set of Yellowstone. All right? So typical scenario between my wife and me. Now the other third one uh, is people's potential, as I've talked about. This is kind of embarrassing because we used to go to Dairy Queen quite a bit, um, and I, I liked the chocolate cone. We'd even go in the dead of winter, all right? I like chocolate cones a lot. But got, we went there so much, so many times that Travis, the kid at the Dairy Queen window, got to know us and he started calling me the cone guy. And I was so impressed with the service he provided and his outgoing nature. And I, one again, I'm seeing like, man, you can do better than Dairy Queen. So I bring him over to the office. I try, try and help him and do these sorts of things. And the point is, it's nothing specific about me. It's just that I like doing this stuff. You know, and I'm dragging a kid from Dairy Queen over to my office. And it gets at some detailed specificity of this micromotive because one of the, peop one of the groups that I love helping the most, because you get down into the specifics, are young people you know, uh, young residents, uh, teenagers. I mean, I just, I love doing that. And when I retired from clinical practice and I was at Minnesota for 20 years, the thing I missed the most by far was the residents and being able to interact with them. One more micromotive of mine is that I like to try new things. And this is a link that I've created between Siri and ChatGPT. Now I don't have to scroll through websites, you know, looking for my answer, it just gives it to me. And I am always like this with food, technology, new ideas. And when I met my wife, Lee, she wouldn't touch sushi. And I actually thought this is a deal breaker, potentially. Fortunately, she came around on that one. Now, and when people are resistant, and this gets at, again, that vivid reaction. When, peop when people are resistant for me to trying new things, it drives me crazy. I just think, just try it, for God's sakes. Why not, you know? So this is Mike Mattis. This is literally what drives me. These are my engines, all right? Creating systems, solving complex problems, helping people realize their potential. And then innovation is the bedrock of all of that. And this is true from the dishwasher all the way to work in everything that you do. These patterns are there. They're not going away. They're part of who you are. And when you ignore them, that's when the trouble comes, okay? And you ignore them at your own risk or this can happen. Now the next part of this, after you've got your micromotives, is to make the right choices to the very best of your ability. And they have to be in the direction of your micromotives. So you say yes to your micromotives and yes to you. And as an example, as I alluded to 11 years ago, I found myself in the place, Hazelden Treatment Center, a bit north of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Minneapolis and Minnesota. And when I was there, I was voted least likely to succeed by my fellow inmates. Now, you just imagine I'm in treatment and I'm voted least likely to succeed. This is not good, right? I'm happy to report, though, I was, in voted, I was voted most improved later on. But given where I started from, I can't really put a plaque on the wall about that one. But when I was there, my counselor hammered me constantly every day. You got to keep a gratitude journal and write three things in it that you're grateful for every day, you know? And I'm like, Man, you don't understand. I got bigger fish to fry than some goddamn gratitude journal. So I wasn't buying any of it, all right? <laughs> I mean, I'm up here, all right? You understand what's going on. Well, after I got out three months, <laughs> I was searching for the best way to live. You know, I'm looking for a system, right? And I tried this 12-step program. I really gave it the, my full-on shot, but it just didn't work for me. It seemed too rigid and too, you know, you're always looking at your defects and stuff, and I needed something a little more positive. And so one day, my daughter, Maya, who's the messy dishwasher woman, uh, sent me a gratitude video. Uh, she was at Boston College at the time, and it changed my life. And so I'm watching this video in my living room, and it's about the science of gratitude. It's a young student at Boston College that did a senior thesis and did a, a study on gratitude. And it was like, oh, there's increased happiness. Uh, people have more self-compassion and uh, less stress. And I was like, okay, so there is some data to this. This is, I was wrong. And I looked up the self-compassion thing, which I'd never heard of, and I thought, that sounds pretty cool, all right? And so I decided I'm gonna sign up for a retreat. And I went on a self-compassion retreat in the middle of the desert in California. Now, I found myself in this large room with 60 women and four other men. 
and we're all sitting on cushions and pillows and stuff, and we have little things that the instructor's talking about, and we talk about our feelings, right? Okay, I didn't even know how, what feelings do I have? I mean, it was like, what's going on? And then, you know, we were meditating and putting our hand on our heart and stuff. I can't even tell you how many times I almost just got up and left. I thought, this is way too far out in left field for me. But I stuck it out, and I'm so glad I did. And the point here is that I am following my micromotives by trying new things. I'm looking to create a system for mental health and health and that things that could help other people realize their potential and be better. And although the, the crucial point here is that this choice may have seemed crazy at hell, as hell at the time, and I can tell you that, you know, if I talked to my surgeon friends at the time, they would have thought, what are you doing, you know? But, and I had no long-term goal or intention. It just felt right, like it was something I was interested in. And I had to ignore this, what I call the standardization covenant devils that were in my head. And these babies live in all of our heads, and they come at us from inside our head, and they come at us from other people. Things like, oh, well, you don't have the time for that, or I don't have the time. What will others say if you do this sort of thing? You can't afford it. You're not good enough, you know? It's impractical, a waste of time, stupid idea. I mean, what will others think, all right? The point is the hell with all that. You've got to ignore those devils and get after it in terms of pursuing your micromotives. And one point that I really want to emphasize here, it appears to be a binary choice between choosing the standardization covenant path or following you know, your micromotives. But it's actually an artificial, like most binary choices, it's artificial. Because one can design a fulfilled life outside of the standardization covenant or within it. And the point is, within it, you got to just be very careful and intentional about the choices you make to fulfill your micromotives and who you are within your career. Uh, and you got to avoid all the shoulds. There's so much pressure to do certain things in our careers. And a lot of it, we ha some things we have to do, there's no question. But a lot of it, you can really interrogate and say, do I really need to do this? Is this that important for me? Now, the third piece of this fulfillment puzzle is to find your strengths. But unlike micromotives, strengths are discovered by action, by doing things. And he gives the example in the book, if you took 100 people and had them ride a hippopotamus, a very small percentage would be good at riding a hippopotamus out of the gate. And that's the point. I would not be good riding a hippopotamus out of the gate. It would kill me. Then you only discover these kinds of you know, strengths through experimentation. And the thing about your strengths, you really need to know them and you need to own them. Uh, you know, and you use them without hubris because your strengths are the strategies that you use to bring your micromotive choices to their fullest expression. This talk and the concepts within this talk are a major effort on the part of myself using my strengths as a teacher, innovation, bringing all this together and putting it, I hope, in a cogent form, uh, solving a complex problem about how to try and find fulfillment using my entire experience in reading literature, and also trying to make this very complex topic practical for the people in the audience. So my strengths are allowing me to use my natural drivers to bring it all to fruition. And the key here, and I'm just going to read, when you learn to know your micromotives, you can engineer your own passion which endows you with energy and authenticity. I'm sure you all know, if you do something that is naturally interesting to you, it's energizing. And if you do things that you don't find interesting, it sucks the life out of you. And of course, we all have to do some of that, but the point is to do as much in terms of following those micromotives as possible. Next piece is by making the choices aligned with your micromotives, you can engineer your own purpose which provides you with meaning and direction. And when you leverage your strengths as strategies for bringing those things to fruition, you can engineer your own achievement. And this all fuels your ability to be your best self in life and for your weird to flourish. And in my opinion, knowing your weird and getting it to flourish as much as possible is the way that you can make the very best contribution to this world of ours. Now the final principle is to ignore the destination. And this will seem weird because it's way outside the standardization covenant. The destination is what it's all about in that world. So as an example, when I went on that first self-compassion retreat, well, I was like, okay, this is interesting. 
No idea where it's going? I'm going to sign up for a second one. I learned how to teach self-compassion. Then I said, well, this is more interesting. I'll sign up for meditation retreats. I went on those. And then I started reading in depth about all this stuff. And I wrote the Resilience Bank Account paper that Vino uh, referred to. And I had never for a moment set out to write articles, coach people, host a podcast, The Resilience Surgeon, run a book club, coach groups, speak here to, in front of you today. This was not a goal. It happened organically because of I followed my micromotives and my choices and my weird. This is all stuff I love doing. I never get sick of it. It's all in my fulfillment sweet spot. And by making those choices aligned with my micromotives and leveraging my strengths, I found my destination instead of picking a destination. Now the life preserver for your weird is the word no. The priority is to say yes to you and to your weird and no as much as possible to all the rest. Because, if you, because what you focus on grows. That's categorically the truth. Now, in kind of wrapping up here, seeing and valuing other weirdos, because this is really about other people also. And I believe this is a crucial quality of personal leadership in our orbit, both at home and at work. Uh, because most people have no idea about this stuff. We know we're kind of different, but we're not all robots, you know. And my, as an example, my wife, Lee, is a high-risk obstetrician. And ever since I met her, our, our house has been filled with art. She's, when she wasn't taking care of the kids or working, she was always painting, uh, doing mosaics. I mean, just always doing it. Incredibly, incredible drive for them. Our house is filled with beauty because of hers. Well, four, four years ago, I decided to buy our one-month painting course in Florence, Italy. And all the standardization covenant devils came out when I told her, can't go, that's too much time, it's expensive, uh, I'm, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough to go to that course, you know, all these things. And the litany was incredible. And we convinced her, you're going, this is going to happen. Because I even engineered making sure she had the month off. And she came back, retired, <laughs> and enrolled in art school and she's never been happier in her life. Now, I'm not suggesting you need to leave your career, but it's, it points out an important thing. I mean, this was so big a deal to her. Now, my kids, I was a disciple of the standardization covenant. This is what you do, you go to high school, you get a college degree, you figure out what career you wanna pursue, and then you attack it, and then you got your situation squared away. I've changed my mind. I view it very differently now. Uh, this is my son, Sam. I helped kind of push him into the Naval Academy. He really didn't belong there. He's a physical animal. And one of the reasons he got in is because he boxed and did all these things. He's a really physical man. But he hated it there. The, he's not the kind of guy that likes structure and organization. He can come into a room in his bedroom coming home after not having been there for a year, and in 10 minutes, the, the room is a crap hole. I mean, <laughs> it is a crap hole. And, you know, I tried to change it. He can't change it. He's happy out on a tarp, sleeping under the sun's sun. He had a below-the-knee amputation. I don't know if you can see it there. Uh, after a motorcycle accident that he bought after he got back from deployment, he just hiked the Pacific Crest Trail in faster times than the vast majority of people with two legs. And now he's gearing up to ride a bike from the top of Alaska to the bottom of Patagonia, or to Patagonia. So this is, this is what he's about. This is his weird. My daughter Maya, who's over there, I didn't really know her until I got a glimpse one day when I walked into her bedroom and she was applying to colleges. And she basically had this massive Excel spreadsheet on the wall with every kind of detail and data about all the 20 schools that she applied to. All right? And I, I had no idea this was going on. Well, now, you know, she discovered running and she loves running. She's run the Boston Marathon in 313. She's working for a startup women's tennis shoe company and she's happier than she could ever be. And it's her weird is this sort of thing, that kind of detailed metrics and physical activity. She's finding herself. I don't know where my daughter Anne is going to go. I can tell you what I observe. When you walk into her room, it's like walking into a church. The Buddha's there, the incense is running, you can't sit on her bed because it's so perfectly made, it smells very nice in there. Nobody can enter this sanctuary. And when she travels, she needs a suitcase for all of her beauty products, all right? Now, nobody in my house uses a lot of beauty products, but Anne uses a lot. Even my wife, she didn't get this from any of us. It's just her natural driver. 
And my approach to my children now is to basically, I hope, create a love bubble. You know, I have three expectations. Pursue your weird, find it and pursue it and do everything you can to do that. I want excellence in whatever you do. That's, that's important to me. And then finally, just take care of yourself. Take care of your body, your soul, your spirit, okay? Now, we're entering, pun intended, a weird time. Uh, the standardization covenant is fading. I don't know if you're aware of it, but you know, the age of personalization is coming into our lives, and you see it in the residents and everybody else. And the point is, we are not, like we think, interchangeable robots. We are individual, unique human beings with needs and desires and stuff that are very unique. And I encourage you to get curious about other people's weird, because it's one of the ways to really allow people to be seen and heard and connect with them. And actually, just as a side note, I want to just make a plea for everybody in this audience to think about the people that you work with in your division or your department. One of the common problems that I see everywhere in our specialty is that people are siloed as sort of uh, individuals in a department, but not in an individual way like I'm talking about. It's like, okay, here's your office, here's your money for the research and so forth, but do they really get to know each other? I mean, I've visited so many places, and often the faculty don't even really know each other. You know, what makes them tick? What's unique about them? I believe that this is the next frontier for our leadership and our specialty to create a much more cohesive team and integrated, you know, people integrated together, fostering each other's weird and their ability to succeed. I really, this is crucial stuff, and it's clear in the world of leadership that this is the way forward, all right? It's what works. Now, finding your weird, it's work, like anything that's useful and valuable. And it's cur it takes courage to not simply default to the standardization covenant process. Remember, real success is fulfillment, and if you don't, you can end up like me later in life, staring at that oak tree, dormant, stripped of energy in life, waiting for spring. As Nietzsche said, he who has a why to live for can bear with almost any how, because pursuing fulfillment again is energy giving. And your micromotives are like the first leaves on a tree. The first few capture some sunshine, which fuels your ability to continue to grow. And as you make more choices based on your micromotives, your strengths start to emerge like branches and trunks of a tree. And as you make more choices based on your micromotives, your fulfillment tree gets bigger and bigger. And by God, you really start to know in your bones that you're doing what you should be doing. And when you get to my age and the pearly gates are right around the corner, you can say, I did it my way and that feels damn fulfilling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, that was outstanding. Really, uh, really appreciate that, it's very inspiring. Um, for the sake of time, I think we'll leave questions for uh, maybe the audience to maybe come up, and I know you'll be around yeah, talk to me. inside, outside. Absolutely. So I think we'll we'll do that, and we'll end this session for the keynote. But that was a um, it's a great tie-in to my talk yesterday about the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, and I think we need to think more about ourselves sometimes. Continue the innovation, but think about ourselves. Absolutely, Thanks. great man. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah.